Hey everyone, Peter Zion coming to you from my second most favorite Florida city, Fort Lauderdale, which where unfortunately I have no free time uh, because the world is exploding. And the particular explosion that I want to talk about today, which is July 8, is the assassination of former Japanese Prime Minister Abe Shinzo. Now, I don't have a lot of insight here into what happened specifically. He was shot during a political speech. His assailant has been arrested. Abe did die earlier today, bleeding out in the hospital. But I think it's worth putting all of this into context. Uh, Japan, Japan is a country that has largely purged political violence from its system. Now, back in the pre-industrial days of the 1800s and before, Japan was a radically different place, almost primal. The samurai controlled most of society and violence among them was quite common. But when industrialization happened, the new alliance of the new businessmen plus the emperor largely purged most violence from the local government and that included the more literal purging of the samurai class itself. Uh, this is the, the, Meiji the Meiji restoration for those of you familiar with the time period. Now, at the national level, violence remained because now we're talking about nationalist, fascist, imperial Japan. And that's what brought us to the Japanese war machine and the Pacific theater of World War II. With the end of World War II, this strain of political violence was largely purged as well. Weapons became very difficult to get a hold of at all. In fact, in all of calendar year 2021, Japan had one gun-related death. Last week, the United States had 220. So having somebody walk up to a podium with a gun is just not something that happens. So that's, that's the backdrop of the, the current moment. I want to focus on two things for today. Uh, first of the, all, for those of you who are more conspiracy-minded, uh, let's, let, let's get you noodling over something tangentially pointing in the right direction. So Japan's ruling Liberal Democratic Party, of which Abe is a member and served as prime minister for, is not a normal center-right party in the way that we think of maybe the Republicans or the French Nationalists or something like that. It's linked to the survivors and the successors of Imperial Japan. Uh, their roots are firmly fascist, and you don't have to go back... Wow, this hair is out of control. <laughs> you don't have to go back too far uh, to find uh, some sketchy stuff going on in interior Japanese politics. Uh, specifically to the Abe family, they're certainly not violence-free. Uh, it may have fallen from conventional memory, but Abe's maternal grandfather, also with the LDP, was also the target of an assassination back in the 1960s. So, you know, those of you who like to make conspiracies, why don't you run with that? Uh, second, some broader cultural context. Now, I am just speculating because we don't know anything about the assassin at this moment, but Japan does not, as a rule, embrace change. This isn't the United States, where the lack of internal barriers to movement means that we're always interacting with and arguing with one another and where challenges and change are the norm. Instead, Japan is a series of mountainous islands, with at best weak connections among the population centers. Governing Japan traditionally requires the establishment of a very delicate balance among its various regions. Its foreign policy under the United States' globalized order for the last 70 years has been remarkably static, focusing on trade and resource access while part of the American Alliance network. These dual balances have served the Japanese very well, and they're actually reminiscent of many of Japan's previous cultural periods. The Japanese strive for stability. Change means a disruption of the balance, and that's pretty common for cultures that are resource poor. Instability itself is the enemy. And so the Japanese and countries like them tend to ignore small changes until those changes build up into something overwhelming and then it all breaks apart at once. The place changes radically and in a searing matter, almost overnight. Japan is definitely moving towards one of those shakeups now. The American security guarantee is not what it once was. The rise of China has provided a local competitor. Demographic implosion in both China and Japan and around the world is changing economic models. And the post-war global system has taken Japan about as far as it can go. Everything's up in the air now. If Japan is going to have one of those occasional cultural shakeouts, now is about the time that you would expect it to happen. Which suggests that things are about to get very real. The assassination itself, well, obviously not great, is likely not the real problem and just a symptom of a broader societal shift. 
The last time the Japanese had one, it didn't end until the nuclear destruction of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The time before that, it required the physical liquidation of the samurai as a class. When China changes, it changes everything. It does it wholesale, it does it violently, and it remakes its region. And this time, Japan is already the second strongest naval power with the world's third largest economy. So the implications of this sort of shift are going to be massive. Now, uh, there's an entire chapter in Disunited Nations dedicated to the rise, fall, and now re-rise of the Japanese system in the post-globalization era. So if you're looking for more, that's probably the best way for you to get started.